Welcome to the Wildlife Podcast. On this episode, guys, we have the the Godfather, absolute pinnacle of deer hunting stories. The man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Charlie Beatty, the Prince of Poacher. Uh, if you guys haven't checked out his book, part one is already out. Part two is on the way. He also has a lot of great podcasts out. Probably the best storyteller that deer hunting and the outdoor industry has ever seen. And uh, he's he's got some wild ones coming this episode, guys. So just buckle up. Um, but as always, brought to you by Whiskey and Wildlife Apparel. Uh, go check us out on whiskeyandwildlife.com. Get you a hat. Get you a hoodie. T-shirts are on there as well. So um you know support us we're going to keep bringing you guys some good entertainment some great podcasts also uh one of our newer sponsors still trap and tactical uh still trap and tactical um custom firearms here in central florida Uh, if you guys are looking for any gun work or to build any weaponry go ahead and check them out you can find them on instagram our buddy cody constantini with still trap and tactical and then also rob septic here in central florida They'll get you out of a shitty situation. Uh, Rob Septic, our first sponsor we ever had uh, for the podcast, uh, they bought us some whiskey, and we said, "Hey, that's good enough. You're you're our, you're, our, you're a sponsor now." So, <laughs> so Corey, you know it's coming, man. What I mean, what'd you think? I mean, Charlie's just a he's one of one. He, uh, uh the man can tell some stories. I mean, like no other. Um, this is poaching stories, you know. And uh, we hear a lot of times people put that down. This is in the past. We're here for good times. We're here for good stories. We're not going to sit here and say, oh, we don't support this, blah, blah, blah. The man did it. And we love to hear it. That's why we had him on. He's an absolute legend. And uh, I know everybody's going to enjoy it. I don't got to say it. Hell yeah. Yeah, there's no disclaimers coming from us, guys. These are some fantastic stories. Just sit back, enjoy them for what they are. We're going to have a good time, as you'll see. Oh yeah. And uh Charlie's coming back. There ain't no doubt. So this is just, you know, we will call we won't call this part one, but uh he's already reached out where uh there's gonna be more to come. So enjoy this one. All right, y'all. Welcome to the Wildlife Podcast presented by Whiskey and Wildlife. Tonight we have an absolute legend with us. We're excited to have him. Real quick story. Uh last year, as you guys know, we went to Kansas out to CNS Whitetail. And the whole time we were in Kansas, we had a mantra. It was WWCBD. What would Charlie Beatty do? And tonight, guys, we got Charlie Beatty on the podcast with us. The legend himself, the Prince of Poachers. We're excited to hear some stories. We've been a fan of his for a very long time. Most of you guys have probably heard of him, heard his stories on different podcasts. We couldn't be more excited to have him on. So, Charlie, how you doing, brother? Doing good. Doing good. Hell yeah. Thank you for taking the time, man. Thanks for yeah. joining us tonight. I know you have a million stories. We're going to get a couple of them tonight. I know uh, we got Mike Ornelis with us. We got Corey Bates with us as well. Mike, why don't you kick it off, man? I know you had a couple of stories that you and Charlie have talked about before you wanted them to focus on. Absolutely. So not only thanks for being here, Charlie, but thank you, buddy, for setting everything up. Yeah. Um, I know... You and I talked on the phone. It's been a while, so I'm going to try my best to refresh your memory for this one story. I'm sure you got a hundred more like it, but there was one where you were going to, I think one of the windmills to go get some water and you're walking up on this big oak and you heard the choppers coming and that sucker come in and zipped in on you and dropped in on top of you. And you said you felt like you were in a war zone. You thought you were going to have to shoot the pilot out of that helicopter. I know what story you're talking about. It's coming in part two. It's on the 27 day hunt. And three days in a row, they had been flying. And first day, day one, it sounded like a cattle roundup. Then when they moved east beyond me another five or six miles out near Kennedy Point, I thought, okay, December 15th, I got to make something happen. I wasn't going to waste my time because they were in the area. So I went on and hunted. I went east towards them, got in a depth sand dune area below there in the depths of the oaks. And I rattled, and this is going, I'm going to go ahead and tell the whole story leading up what you're talking about. And uh, I'm on a, a hot dough with a spike. See, could have been a six-point. And I'm also seeing this really big meal guy, and I was hunting with the longbow then, and I thought, what a perfect time to kill the blue bull and, you know, not make any noise. So I was drawing to shoot the blue bull, 
it was about a 45 yard shot but i felt like i was sticking good anyway you know so as i'm coming up with the bow this doe is over there just driving that little six point crazy stomping her foot every other step just hitting the ground hard with that foot you know he's just going nuts he's up for ass and all of a sudden when i'm in the middle of my draw for the blue bull shot I hear two, 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 two booms and a big 10 point jumps across that little break I was in front of and right over the gap and into that live oak mud and ran out there after that doe. He could hear her stomping the ground. He went after that impulse. He knew what was going on. I did too, but I was like, damn, I ought to shoot that deer. He was heavy. I didn't get a picture of him. He was real heavy. He, he had a eight at a nine point frame, but he had a split fork making 10 points, but he was real heavy through the beams. Nothing is more impressive on the hoof than mass. And that turns me on. I don't know about everybody else. But. So I just dropped the bow and Amen. everything and got the rifle and went after him. And he played cat and mouse on me a time or two in that mock. He would go this way and disappear when I'd step out to get the shot. He was gone. I'd go back in the live oak, go back around to get an angle. Finally, I got the right angle. And I mean, I broke his neck and dropped him in the sand. And I ran out there and grabbed <laughs> him and drug him all the way up in out of that. He just bald right there. And. Boy, here I hear a, a car, sound like a game warden car, crawling real slow down the, the gravel road. I was very near the main road. Probably wasn't 400 yards off of it. Well, like I said, I heard all these 18 wheelers going in, and I thought they had a cattle roundup going. Knew they did, pretty sure of it. And one of them starts coming back. And as that game warden car pulls to a stop, that 18 wheeler meets him head up right out there 400 yards from me. I could just see them game wardens going, shh. And he goes, ah, ah. <laughs> 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 he probably knew he was busting them. And so I just come across my face. I just kept caping him real fast, got him caped off, cut his head. And I moved up in under that sand dune because they pulled a chopper over there. They got, you know, control of someone in charge. Send me a bird over here and look for this outlaw we got pinned down right here. He shot right here. They worked it so hard, I stayed hit down for a couple of hours. Finally, it got quiet. He moved out of the area, convinced he wasn't going to find me. And I was just under the lift of these sand dunes in that real thick shrub down there. And I got hungry by then. I said, I'm going to eat his heart. So I cut his heart out of there and had it. And there's underloins. I cut the underloins out right quick. And I had the underloins. No, I did have the heart. This has been uh, 96, 97. I'm slow on some things, but it comes to me as I'm talking about it. I did have the heart. And I, that's usually what buzzes you. You can't sit still after eating heart rare fried heart you got to get up and move so i started eating on the heart i said hell i'm gonna go ahead and make a break and get out of here now and the next day i had the honeys and they flew the hell out of that they came right to me and brought in these damn gunners uh, operation desert storm tan beige gunners gun high-rise gun racks had a shooter up in the back on a big high-rise chair I saw them. I peeked out through some brushes. They blew by me trying to get to this windmill and get some water. I just went back to camp. And they were popping shots all around me. Just pop, 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 pop. I'd hear buckshot out of the helicopters. <laughs> and then they, they got a, a distance away from me. And I said, I'm on a hunt. I went east and stayed in that brush near the free <laughs> windmill. The windmill there just tore down now, wrapped up those the damn dunes from a hurricane tornado or something. And I went out through there and they brought them right back and started chopping the shit out of where I was. I went right back to my camp. I said, fuck it, I'm going to stay in camp all day tomorrow, and I did. I was pinned down and just all them shots going on all around me unnerved me that day, that day three. And I was like, I can't get up and do nothing. I, I need water. I'm out of water. I'm going to have to wait till dark. I was mad all day and, and pissed. I felt like wartime where your, your nerves at some old uh, war veteran is, is having a flashback. And I was just struck, you know, nerves, man. I was real uneasy and mad. I was pissed off. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do? Well, I said, I'm going to have to wait till pitch dark. I'd go to that windmill, what was left of it. And what that was, was I'd taken a buddy a couple of years earlier. And we found the lateral line from that wellhead that was just pouring out on the ground. The pressure, the artesian pressure was just pushing water up and out that pipe. And I'd send him over there to check it. I said, go check the end of that pipe. He picked it up and goes, ain't nothing in it. And I said, pick it up just above the water level and hold it for a minute and see if it's running. Something's got to be making all this water out here on the ground, Larry. And so he did, and he saw it start running. He goes, it's running. I said, I'll be right there. Well, that's when we found that was producing clear, pure water. So we jacked our jugs under it and got all the water we wanted. But that's where I was. And I was just over there getting set up. I was fixing to unload all my jugs out of the pack. I had a bag of clothes 
in a big trash bag and I was going to put a little miniature deal of laundry detergent in there and wash all my socks and shit too. And man, all of a sudden it was like a bomb went off. Loud noise, loud uh, bright lights. Boom! It went off and I looked up 800 yards, maybe nine, up the swell to the north of that throat. There was a grassy throat there between two big bodies of live oak. And I didn't even hear him coming. It was a chopper that was still out. I had not heard him all leave. I just thought I had. He burst over that horizon and just immediately banked and flared and come straight at me. I thought he knew I was there. First thought I had was he know he's got me on a beeper screen or something. He just started coming right at me. But all he was really probably doing was this big spotlight right under the helicopter shined all the way to me. I broke and ran 70 yards all the way around with nothing but my rifle. I let the backpack sitting there and everything scattered and just ran with my rifle. And I'm running up through the live oaks. He's on me. He's lighting it up inside those live oaks. It's about a 60-yard patch of live oak in that what used to be the old Parita windmill trap. And I'm running up in there looking right and left for a little old clump of stick shimmy or something to get in behind. And it just turns the daylight in there. I had had it. My nerves were unraveled. I just fell over on my back when I dove in, threw the gun up, pushed it off safety, and put the crosshairs right on the bubble. I said, you stop, I'm going to shoot you down. I was talking to him you know yelling at the loud at the top of my voice and they didn't stall and they just went right on around me and i peeked out there and watched where they were going and they just be like due northwest towards sarita and probably set it down at, on a trailer there i didn't know when it come from that far i think i counted seven or eight helicopters in action throughout that cattle roundup on the first day but by the third day i was tired of it i mean i was mad you know like m-a-double-d not m-a-d and that's <laughs> in the you know real trouble i really believe as, as upset as i was had they come back had they banked back like they saw me or thought they saw me i think i would have shot them down and this was uh i want to say this was 93 or 4 and so whoever was in that chopper when they hear this story they're going to know it because they know the route they took. They were so low that I didn't hear them come until they burst over that live oak into that grassy throat, and they immediately took a left-hand turn due south right at the Parita windmill, and that's when they came right on me. And of course, apparently they didn't have a clue. They did not see me at all. They didn't see my gear laying out there, the camo pack, didn't catch their eye, and they thought nothing of it if they did see any part of the, the stuff, my jugs and stuff that I had laying out there. But I really believe I would have shot them down. I mean, that's just close to getting in really big trouble as I've ever been in there. And I thought, man, I would have had to swim back in Bay. I would have had to walk to a friend's house and have him smuggle me out like an illegal all the way back to Fort Worth or something to get me out of that area. Because they would have been a manhunt. If I'd have downed that chopper, it would have killed at least two men that would have been in it. And they'd have just been buried right in that sand dune beside that old curled up windmill where that tornado took it out. And I mean, I thought about it for days and I said, I'm just glad it didn't turn into something really tragic because it come real close to, you know, that that's as close to real as I've been in, in there. I mean, that's just hairy. It's it. probably a good thing those guys, it's probably a good thing those guys were just as wore out as you. They probably want to get their ass home. You know they what were I mean? Tired you know, and they and all that. Yeah, they were just wanting to get home with their lives. They don't know how close they came. I had the crosshairs on the bubble. I mean, I followed it right as it come over me, you know. Had they just Jeez. let off the gas and stalled in it all like they saw me. Because I, I thought they were going to shoot me. I was in fear of my life. That's the, that's the oh, one yeah. time I've been afraid of, that they were going to kill me if they'd seen me. I thought, you know, like I said before about another episode in the brush pile with helicopters, I had this big head of hair then, and I thought, well, they see that. They're going to shoot a buckshot pattern right on it like it's a coon or something in the brush or a cow and, and take me out. So I was thinking they'd make a headshot on me, you know, so that's why I was, you know, so scared. I thought I'm going to shoot them down. It's me or them. Yeah. Man, that, you know, that's as scary as ever <clears throat> I got another one I want to hear, Charlie. Um, okay. I don't need to cut you off, Brandon, if you're going to say something. That, um, I know there's one where you were saying you killed, I can't remember if it was a drop, double drop time or just an absolute giant of a deer when you were butt naked in your sleeping bag. <laughs> I, I was gonna shoot well i shot one butt naked but i thought you're talking about a single drop it's in part one about the single it might drop. be a single drop yeah see the single drop i was naked from the waist down and 
I followed him a while to get blowing me up and running, and I finally couldn't get a shot and gave up. And when I looked down, all I saw was hair in a helmet, and I said, that's time to get back. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't feel it because my feet were so frozen, but when I got to thawing out my feet, they were full of grass burrs, broke off all in my feet. It took me 30, 40 minutes to pick all them grass burrs, broke off out of my feet before I could put my socks Jeez, and boots really? on. But I've killed a double <laughs> drop in a sleeping bag, you know, naked from the waist down, had my shirt back buttoned up, and I'd hit the horns once already. I hit them again, had a super kick with me, my lifelong buddy. And uh, boy, that buck, there was three bucks already on us. Steve was thinking I should try and prod me to shoot this 11.23 inch basket horn typical, but I said, I don't want him. And I buttoned up another button or two, and I reached down and popped the horns again. And when I did, boy, Brush started breaking about 45 yards from us. I mean, he'd come out from under this overhanging limb of the live oak into a brightly lit, right at daylight. It was very light there, but dark mostly around us. And when he came in, it's like a spotlight on stage was on him. And he looked this way and looked that way at them other bucks. And then he took off chasing them. He chased this one. He chased that one. And they just scattered. They didn't want nothing to do with that double drop. And I was like, what is wrong with his rat? I knew there was something real funny about it immediately, but I didn't catch on real quick and then i went double drops well i pulled out in front of him and got the crossbar <laughs> level with his body and let him run through shooting off one knee with a dead wrist i just timed him and shot right when he crossed through the crosshair and hit him right on the crease and coop and this one crip was one blowing a chunk out of a tree the day before that wasn't like him he was usually a crack shot and so i broke the boat that buck went about 20 yards just piled up I looked at him, I said, back there, you shoot a buck. He goes, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he ripped me off. He said, that could have been my deer, but you talked me into shooting that one last night, you know. But, yeah, yeah, that, that goes down in the history books. Nobody has ever duplicated that. I bet my life on it. No one's ever shot, rattled up, and shot a double drop up. He's a 160 buck. And done it in half naked in the slick bag, double bag to double drop. <laughs> Nobody's ever duplicated that. That's a one of a kind story. I mean, that's just as real. Absolutely. Right out the witness. 100%. Keep on for witness. That was a hell of a deal. He's a beautiful deer. Jeez, that picture right. of him in the book. He, he's, he's far more beautiful. He was only five and a half. He's far more beautiful than he would have been a year or two later. It, you know, about a, you know, but it was his last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Charlie, you, you, you know, were out there hunting the King and Kennedy ranch for, for years. Do you have an idea of maybe how many bucks you took off of the King and the Kennedy over, over all that time? I've killed over 50 of the big ones. The friends of mine that went with me shot the other 50, 60 something, you know, 160 yeah. in total. But, you know, some of them killed some 170, mid 170 class deer. And with bows, you know, I began to bow hunt more as I went back out of retirement after that bad divorce. And the cops got me started hunting again. And, you know, <laughs> that's when we got as stealth as we could concerning getting away with it because the heat was on. So we were trying to use bows more for that reason than just to get a good bow kill. But, you know, that's all part of the game, too. But we were, we were trying to be quiet in there because, and I had some downloads made up to, you know, not make as much noise on my rifle. And uh, that helped a lot, you know, especially when you shoot camp meat, you know, all you want to do is just get as quiet as you can right before dark, get your meat and, and, and have meat for the next two, three days. But yeah, they got, it got hot. There's some real heat on them last nine years, you know, somewhat more than the early days. Tom, even though Tom East was dead, and he's the guy that used to chase me in helicopters. There was some heat in the latter years. He was your biggest fan the whole time you were hunting out there. <laughs> I could see him up there in them helicopters. All right, you little son of a bitch. I know you're here somewhere. Where are you at, you little bastard? <laughs> <laughs> he probably had more fun chasing me than he did any of his ranching and, you know, any of it. Yeah. You want to – um tell that story that one buck you chased i think it was right there behind some apartments or whatnot when you hunted that deer so hard you about froze to death out there he'd always oh, be that, one that field that, of evil. Special, that 26 inch spread 10 point 
he was a book 174 something like that uh, the rumor was two years after i had been chasing him uh, debbie shelton bobby shelton's daughter killed that deer and at that time it scored 172 and it was a full 26 inch inside spread the butcher up at bishop that did the meat told us about it yeah but that's uh that's in part one and i was hoping yeah. to talk about some more of this part two stuff coming and uh, i can't remember we uh we lined up well you know what i'll tell you the story that kind of irritates me that was never told and my boss at the tax army there at alpine in fort worth he would have me tell that story about that one tough six point more than any other story now that was back no in the old <laughs> A lesser amount of stories that I had, but that's as crazy as it got. Um, we went in October, me and two 16 year old boys. I was 24. It was a year I killed Big John, but it was previous to that. And that October, this kid, his name was Billy Coleman. I don't know if he's still alive or not now, but uh, he may be. Hope he's not involved with the ranch in any form because this might hurt his reputation. <laughs> <laughs> and this other kid worked with me at the taxidermy. And Billy had built this periscope spotlight. He had a four by four beam about four feet long. He had two handles in it where you could steer it like a telescope, like a periscope in a submarine. And a 20 million candle power light at the top. And I'm in the back seat behind the <laughs> driver's seat. And one's driving, the other one's sitting in the front to shoot. And I've got that thing up out of the window seat because you could stay inside with your hands and not get them cold out in that wind. And we were over there a little early cool front. And we were over near Evernville, the Robert Ace country and all that, Bruni Alton and, and uh, near Zapata County. And we hadn't lit it up long. I mean, I'm in the back light, working that light. And you could see and read newspaper 300 yards with that spotlight. It was that powerful. <laughs> and all of a sudden, pull in the light, turn it off. I see somebody coming up on us. And Border Patrol pulled us over. He looked at their driver's license and he goes, you boys get back to Kingsville. He didn't even ask for my ID. He had no idea, you know, that I was even, you know, six years, you know, I've been eight years older than them. They were 16, I was 24. So they were eight years younger than me. And uh, he just thought all three of us were 16. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it's dusty in this new office. I'm trying to wash that down. Okay, so he said, y'all head back to Kingsville. I don't see you turn that light back on in this county if you do. I'm going to have a game more than so We go back to Kingsville. Three-hour drive. Went all the way over there for nothing. We let Billy out and unloaded that big periscope light. And I said, I'm not done yet. When we hit the taxidermy shop, this kid said, I said, you want to hit Armstrong? He said, yeah. I said, go get the little spotlight. And uh, we get out that north side of Kingsville on Armstrong Road. We get out there and we get past this brush to where it broke into root cloud. And when it did, here's this about 18 inch 10 point buck. <clears throat> I shot out the pasture side while he held the light on him and dropped him. I think I shot the steering wheel. He was holding the light over the top. And uh, the buck ran 50 to 75 yards to the brush and got in this heavy dense mesquite with head high of johnson grass in it and he went about 30 yards and i said just keep the light on him and he made a leap up in the air it looked like 20 feet because he cleared the mesquites big native mesquites he cleared them 10 12 feet he went back down and made another leap and this time he died in midair it looked like he was 30 feet off the ground <laughs> 20 feet over the end, and he just died in midair fell limp <laughs> and then to help that buck, I said, I'm not going out there after him. He was 100 yards out there. <laughs> said, let's find another one. We went on out and got pretty close to the Champlain Division. And we said, let's, it's too open out here. Let's turn around and go back so we can see the light from pretty far off. And we come back to just past that brush, maybe half a mile, quarter mile. There was a gate. And on that gate, you could see nine sets of eyes, I believe. I believe it was eight or nine sets of eyes. And we were just going to kill me, you know, at this point. So I just said, pick one out and drop him. by right? shooting the head back and neck, something. And they were all looking around. And he just picked one out and just 243. And we had and he dropped it. And I said, go drag him up. I'll turn the truck around back up to the gate. So we can throw him over the gate. And I pulled out back in there and pulled the topper up on that old Dodge Ram Charger and dropped the tailgate. Got over the gate with him. And I said, on three, one, two, three. And over the fence, over the gate, we threw him. 
he landed standing up on the tailgate. Live. <laughs> <laughs> and I just jumped <laughs> over the gate, jumped in the truck, put it down in drive, and wheeled over and put the headlights on him, and stood up in the wheel as soon as I got him lit up, and shot, and it looked like I had the crosshair right on the back of the shoulder of the crease when it went off, and just dropped him about 45, 50 yards. Pull up there, big D running down the ditch to me, you know, and we load him up. We go about five, six miles into town, and we hit this first street, it hit the Arms, no, Corral Street, right there by that Armstrong Station, little bar I've talked about on one of my other podcasts. And we hit that light, and I would keep saying, man, that buck was tough. And I said, yeah, he was tough. I said, where'd you shoot him? He said, high neck, but when he turned his head right as I shot, I must have shot over the bone. And so it didn't kill him. And I said, well, he was tough. He said, what'd you shoot? And I said, well, them all five crosshairs of yours were fading in and out. I couldn't be sure, but I said, it looked like with that bright line on him that I had it right behind the crease. I said, whatever it was, it dropped him. And I was sitting at the red light, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and all of a sudden I could see that buck sitting up looking at me. And I said, oh, shit. I said, don't move. He's trying to do I said, don't move. That buck sitting looking at me. I said, when we get to the shop, you go in and get me a hammer. We got to the shop, he <laughs> got the hammer, he came out and handed it to me. I had stepped out of the truck, pulled that bucket seat forward in the driver's side, and stepped in there and got over the seat and just wham, hit him. I grabbed one horn as I hit him, hit him right in the back of the head with that hammer and just flattened him out. I said, okay, cut the top loose, drop the tailgate, he's down. I thought, one more good lick for good measure. And I grabbed that horn, pulled it forward, and I hit him right in the back of the head as hard as I could. When I did, he just come alive again. Came up, hit the <laughs> truck, and he fell on that ram charger, and then he hit the curtains. I had curtains across the back, and he's hitting them curtains, hitting them curtains. And when he felt that top of it, he kept hitting it. And I'm going, let him out. He's tearing my truck up. He was kicking holes in the bottom of the back of the That was a nice little truck. And he's tearing them curtain rods down on both sides. And I lost control of him and let go. I didn't want to get hooked. And, you know, he let him out and he went straight into that darn cyclone fence and toward the shop there in the parking lot and stuck his rack in that cyclone fence. When he did, I said, get me the axe. Bring me the axe. And so I'm over there with the hammer jumping up and, with the book, and I'm whacking him in the head. And I noticed then his jaw was broken. I going, ah. And I still just waving away with that hammer. All of a sudden, that buck turned around and pop, pop, right in the head. Just two hard pops with his front feet on my forehead. Top of the head and forehead. He knocked me out. I let go of him. He took off running down along all that driftwood we had for all them coffee tables full of quail. And there was a pack of dogs bringing this bitch at the end of the alley. And he ran <laughs> right, right, right in front of them. And they got on his blood trail. And they had his strength. They left the bitch. I mean, that just shows you even dogs would rather hunt there than chase women. <laughs> they left that bitch and ran after that empty. And they stayed on him and ran out of sight. And I said, get the gun out of the car. Get the spotlight out of the car. We're going to go and just my truck and try to run him over. And he goes, we can't do that. Man, if that thing gets, you know, tra blood trail back, first, I wanted to not go after him. He talked me into it. And I said, well, then get rid of the light and the gun. And we're going to take the truck on him and run him over. We stopped three or four times, and I turned the motor off and stand up in the doorway and I listened. Finally, I said, I think I hear him. I think I hear him on the other side of the police station, across 6th Street. Oh, and he Lord. said, all right, that's the only place we hadn't looked yet. So we start going over there. We go right down along Main Nick Chevrolet, the street there. Can't remember the name of it. It could be Kennedy Street. There's King, then there's Kennedy, but I think Kennedy's back south. This street. I think you, I can't be sure, but we, we went from 6th Street right at the police station to 7th. I got my head out the window <laughs> and I said, I think I hear more. I hear them good. I hear them loud. And when I looked up on 7th Street, there that buck was with his head down, sparring off all. They had him bait up. They were circling him like Indians on a wagon train. And he looked up and saw me and I punched it and cut the wheel on that, you know, dodge and punched it coming at him and skidding sideways. And he looked up and saw me and he goes, Oh shit! And he hit that alley, <laughs> and them dogs scattered. And I hit the alley the same way, just sliding sideways, burning rubber, getting the wheel. Hit that alley, punched it. Dumpsters were going poof, 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 poof. <laughs> and there had been a recent rain, and there was jug holes full of water, milky muddy water. I hit one just as the deer was about eight, nine yards in front of the truck, and the windshield just milked. I was nearing sixty miles an hour. 
I could not take a hand off the wheel <laughs> and go to turn the windshield wipers on. I knew I was standing <laughs> that old three speed automatic transmission, that 318 would put you to the seat. And I knew I was fixing to hit that gear and did. And I went, I'm going to run him over. I'm going for broke. Oh, boom, 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 boom. Oh, let's get it. <laughs> tires on desert dog tires i backed up jumped out ran around flipped the top rock dropped the tailgate when i bent over to get the deer big d comes down with the axe i felt the air fan off that axe head oh my he could have took a whole ear off or something any further he would <laughs> and he dropped that buck's neck half in two near and just hide hanging at the front <laughs> Had enough of that shit too. He wanted to come to an end. We go to the shop and we could not find any salvageable meat on the whole deer. I wanted him up under that dog, just crushed him, pulverized him, and then we decided to hell with it. Let's just go throw him in a dumpster. So we went all the way across town and picked the dumpster in an alley and just chunked him in it. You know, but that was one of the funniest damn stories to, to my boss and to everybody that would come in back in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, one tough six point. Hey, he was a tough son of a bitch now. <laughs> what a, what a Holy shit. I can see why your boss wanted you to tell that story multiple times. That's a damn good one. Yeah, and I'd stand up and, you know, just really dramatize it. But old Mario Andretti would have been proud of the driving I did on that bus. <laughs> that ain't no shit. I didn't know I had that in me. You know, I, I probably couldn't do that today, but. You know, when I was 24, I could handle that dodge, fire steering, you know. Yeah. You know, Can't get away with anything these days. We talk about how, you know, if we had a time machine, you know, some people would go back in time and maybe kill Hitler or, you know, solve world <laughs> peace or something. We'd go back in time and hunt with Charlie Beatty. I mean, that's yeah, what right. we do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of them that felt that way in my return and got to. You know, that's basically yeah. what you're describing that happened in the last nine years when I came out of retirement. And one of the oh, you ever... and one of the chapters with the second cop, I named that and, and I'm still debating about to use that title or not, but back into the future with the law on my <laughs> side, the long arm of the law on my side, because that's the cop that got me started hunting with a longbow. And uh you know, recently listening to my podcast with Hunter's Advantage, I talked about the, the, what you call official oppression, using the badge abusively for persuasion in, in politics. And I want to correct myself. I said that that's just not right, that that should never happen. But there is one occasion that that's acceptable on, and that's when you're outlaw hunting with a cop and you use it to get let go when you're stopped on the way home for full of illegal gear. <laughs> I would say so. Loud. <laughs> I think we'd all be okay with that. We all need a good cop buddy on our side for those situations. Oh, I probably would have never went back to a life of poaching without the cops talking me into it. They, they the ones. <laughs> hey, I mean. All the respect to, you know, local law enforcement and whatnot, but we all, we all know, you know, old green jeans, you know, they, they like to push the limit most of the time, you know, some of the biggest outlaws in the area become, you know, come the best game the, wardens. Uh, the game wardens, yeah, the best, exactly. Yeah, best game wardens and next outlaw deer hunter. Um, yeah, that, that's the truth to say that. Yeah, Charlie, so you got part one out. We all got part one. Mike actually bought it for us as a present, so we've all read it, man. You have a, a hell of a lot of stories in it. Everyone should get part one. Prince of Poachers, I got the book right behind me. But, you know, part two's coming out. We know you've been working on it for, for a while now. Yeah. You want to give us just, like, your favorite story out of, out of part two? What do we got to look forward to? Well, there's so many. There's a lot of them. I'll keep them coming. Part two is about 75 deer compared to the 41 in the part one. I've got some favorites. I know I do. It's it's hard for me to just pick one out of the out of the quiver, you know. But uh, I think some of the just funny stuff that happened, you know, that's not 
hunting related. I, I will tell one to be more interesting. I just thought of recently. I took this buddy of mine that's dead now named Big L. Larry, and uh, he was killed in an accidental discharge of a firearm and pistol. And uh, in his honor, I'm going to tell this story because it's funny. You know, we we had a, an eight-day hunt together. We got kicked that out on the highway, and we went all the way to the depths of it and walked all the way to uh, Sarita on the eighth day. And uh, that was a hell of a hunt. But day one, we're about nine miles deep, and I was putting him downwind like I began to do in the brush some because most deer are smarter than Kennedy bucks. They get downwind further in circle when you're coming in on the rattle. So I set him up downwind of me. And a mot, and I got to the edge where I could see out across the sandy break, grassy break. And I beat the bone, and I mean, this buck came running down there to him. I didn't know I heard it. I could hear him going across to Larry. And all of a sudden, I hear, all we had was longbows. My gun was in the camp. I'd left it there the week before. So I hear, and I went, and shot that buck. <laughs> and so I couldn't wait to see it. <laughs> And I was, you know, wanting to stay still, though, and let him take his path and start bleeding good, give us a good blood trail. I didn't know how he'd hit him. And all of a sudden, that buck comes to me when I beat the horns again. I seen a buck come running across the clear in a big eight point with a big J hook on one back time. They old can up for hickey, you know. So I beat the horns to move him closer to me again. That wide 10 point, 20, I got a picture of that deer. 22 inch spread 10 point. He took his picture and then shot him is what he says. And he showed me a picture, and I had to believe it. But the buck comes to me, <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking at him with this one coming running up, and he comes up the sand dune, and they square off. That Larry hit that deer in the back of the neck. He said he ducked and wheeled, and his air went right through the back of the neck, had a foot of air sticking out on both sides of the back of the neck, right the foot of the neck. <laughs> so it wasn't good. Oh, I it and I said, oh, man, they're going to fight. I was wishing he was over there with me then. They bowed up. And they fought, and that tall ape with the J-hook whipped the shit out of that buck in no time at all. And he broke and ran, balled and ran off. And I thought of George. And I thought if George was here, he would have shot him and killed him and said, it just wasn't his tail. <laughs> but that buck ran off. I Larry, I said, you made a real bad hit on him if you'd have stayed cool. This big ape with the J-hook would have come up. He was a better deer. He would have been more shooting. And he goes, well, I'll shoot any of them I want to while I'm out here. I came to kill something. You know? <laughs> he ended up not killing anything for a whole bit long. I, I can't tell that story. It's too long. We're on the. I'll go to the last day on the other kill. This is touching people down there because of the guides and, and the people still in charge down there in the wardens. We're almost to the main ranch house on the way out heading for Sarita. We're about eight or nine miles deep. We're east of the main ranch house about a mile. And it's breaking out of the live oaks into just scattered mesquite and grassland, coastal clump grass and all. And we're not seeing a lot that day, but we did see some deer stands that we had to avoid. And we could see deer stands at a distance out there, about a thousand yards or more over the mesquite, so cool, big tall box stands. And all of a sudden, we're just trying to travel. We're not, you know, hunting and rattling. We're just going to cover some ground and get closer to the highway. It's almost dark. And a buck's chasing a doe right across in front of us. And I said, shoot that buck. He was a good 155 white horned deer, real tall 10 point. And he looked at him and then he let him take off. And I said, I said to shoot that buck. And he goes, well, I still can. And he crossed a little hole over there and he shot him out in the heart, running wide open and dropped him. And I told him, I said, get the camera out. And he goes, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, I rolled all the film back up. He was on his last roll of film earlier that day, and he said, well, it's about over. I'm going to wind this film up. And I told him, I said, don't wind the rest of that film up. You're in the Kennedy Ranch. You can kill a 240, 230, 240. Don't wind the film up. That's all the film we've got. What are you going to do if we kill one, and you can't take a picture? So he just nodded. But he went ahead bullheaded as he was, and he rolled the film up. We couldn't take a picture of that deer on the kill. So I got him caked off. I was mad in hell, and I chewed his ass out. And he told me, he goes, well, I'll say one thing. He said, you chew ass better than anybody I know. So anyway, <laughs> he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm fixed to drag this buck out and the road caked off. He goes, uh-uh. He goes, God will get you for that. And I said, no, he won't. He's the one that gave me the idea. Grab a leg or I'll drag him out there by myself. <laughs> so, all right. So, as we're dragging him to the road, right out in it, we looked up 
But here came those hunters that had been in those stands. Three trucks converged with another one from this angle. I think there was five total when they stopped. They hit an intersection there and they all stopped. And I'm sure they were, and he goes, what do you think they're saying? I said, I know what they're saying. Who shot? We heard the shot. Did you shoot? No, we didn't shoot. We heard the shot. We didn't shoot. <laughs> Somebody shot. And so I said, we've got to get off the road, you know. And we were walking down it and he goes, what are we going to do if one of them turns and comes right up here? And I said, Larry, they can't find it soon enough to suit me. And one of those trucks turned and took that road and came hauling ass right at us about three quarter yards. He goes, damn you, Charlie Brady. I said, hit the brush. And we ran all the way out through that thicket, you know. And we get to Sarita, and Larry had a game plan. He said, I'm going to shave the last morning, put on some smell good when we get to the highway, change clothes, and I'm going to be front runner out at the picnic table looking at a newspaper while we're waiting on the ride man, because we you know, really didn't have a determined time when we were coming out. We were just going to call my ride man from the pay phone there at that old Buckhorn Saloon. So he's doing exactly what he said, you know, but here's what happened. We get near it, and a sheriff circled that whole Buckhorn deal throwing a spotlight. And Larry had back problems. He'd had two spinal fusions and a couple of bulging discs trimmed in his neck, and so he was kind of stove up. And that spotlight's coming around on us on a brute plow, just naked dirt, you know, clots, just a dirt clot field. I said, get down. And we were in kind of a swale, a little wag in the dirt, in the level of the ground. And I looked over at him just as that spotlight was about to get on us. And I saw him just crouched on his knees with that backpack and the rack sticking up. And that one night, <laughs> I just reached up the and just jerked him over on his side. And I said, I said, get down. He goes, like I said. You chew ass better than anybody I know. Position <laughs> <laughs> called my ride. He came and here comes he. First it was a ranch security pulled up, looking over him, and a game warden car pulled in the front. And they talked a minute, and then the security guy come over there and he goes, "What are you doing here?" And Larry's clean shade, you know. Otherwise he'd have had nine or ten days whiskers, and he's on it smell good and has clothes changed, and he goes. I broke down down the road here about eight miles and had to hitchhike up here and waiting on a friend to come get me. And he just folded his newspaper a little and started reading some more. And that guy turned and walked over there to that game one car and they were talking a while. Then they both just drove off. He he completely faked them out of the jockey strap. <laughs> so here comes my ride man in a little bit. He pulls around to the side of the building and Larry just joined me there. I was expecting him. And I just, we loaded everything over there just out of sight from the clerk inside the store. Pulled out of there and went home. But I mean, it was hot after dragging that buck out. And they found it immediately. I mean, that truck came right at us. Obviously, he found it. The heat <laughs> they were looking for us about two hours later when we had time to walk with the last nine miles. Yeah, he, he, he made some other mistakes on that hunt where I threw his ass out. And, and I'll tell that in part two, but it was an eight-day hunt. There's a lot to tell in an eight-day hunt. But uh, one thing funny did happen. He shot a buck by accident. A good buck ran through on the rail, and I said, shoot that buck. He was chasing a doe, and he shot the little spike running up behind him. He didn't see the big one. It comes past the front. I said, you shot the wrong deer, Larry. He goes, you think? I said, I know you did. The big one's gone. So... We went over there and we were looking him over and he goes, what are we going to do? I said, I ain't going to do nothing with that deer. I'm not, we got some, you know, deer meat. I, 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 I said, fuck him, look, the buzzer's heavy, you know? And so we start hearing these pigs squealing. And I said, you hear that? He goes, hogs, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I said, wait right here. So I took an air and went over there and snuck up on this pack of pigs and I stuck this hog because I'd rather eat hog meat. That's way better for you when you're out there. And so I shot this pig, broke her spine, and she squealed like hell. They ran. He said, why did you kill a hog when we had a deer laying there to eat? And I said, Larry, even buzzards prefer hog meat. So a couple of days later, <laughs> then the very next day, we went way out to the west, and we circled around in that free to brush, and we came, as happenstance, we came right by the deer and the hog. Buzzards were all over the pig. And not a one had touched that deer, not even a coyote bit. <laughs> and he looked and he said, Wow, you were right. Even buzzards prefer hog meat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. 
Yeah, I miss him. I wish he was here. If he was here to see the book finally happening, there wouldn't be anybody more proud than Larry. Now, he got eat up with it. Many of his stories are common in part two. You know, he got in it on his own for a while. But the last hunt he made was that one with me. And he wouldn't have took anything for having gone. So that was the highlight of it for him, getting to go with me. He got to turn back the clock and go with me. <clears throat> How long did it take for the, uh, was it the Bishop Outlaws? Is that what they were, the group yeah, you the, hunted with? the group of outlaw deer hunters that had a barbecue every month. And uh, that's what they called themselves, the Bishop Outlaws. Thank How you. long did it take for them boys to try and start hunting with you? Well, actually, they were all afraid to go. They were road hunters. They were, you know, 99.9% .9 road hunters. They did not like having to step off in there, you know, because of all the, they heard <laughs> stuff all their lives about people getting killed. So they didn't like hunting them, you know, on foot. They liked shooting them off the road, you know, get one down and, and wait till dark and go get him out easy less chance of getting caught yeah they were the road hunting kings them and my buddy pat lane you know that i figured after oh yeah i figured after you started taking all the prizes from them they'd want to start running with you figure out your well, trade they still appreciated my deer they enjoyed seeing them i yeah. mean i stole them all to them <laughs> well they you know they that the, the one thing that was said that summed it up was at this barbecue in this one outlaw's backyard and they had a bunch of men standing around there on the campfire out back talking and i just killed the war horse another good deer on the same trip a big 12 point and um uh, i went early and uh let's see i had five already i killed five deer already okay i had those five racks and one of them was the war horse 177 and I came up first to see what was going on, who I was there, and left them in the trunk. And as I was walking up to them, they were all in a circle around that fire and didn't see me coming. And one of them was talking, and he said, that darn Charlie Beatty said, I was talking to Cat Man, told you I was down there the other day. And he said, he done come down here from Fort Worth and outclassed us all. <laughs> and then they said, where they at, Charles? And I said, out there in the trunk. Go get them. We want to see them. And I brought five racks up there and set them on the picnic table, and they were all just crispy. Yeah. And I killed five already that year. I wasn't through yet either. <laughs> that was just one. <laughs> what do you think um, is the biggest deer that you had to get away from you out there, like score wise? That or the one that still eats at you, I guess. Yeah, that buck up an inch and out. He was in the high 220s. Easy and massive beyond your imagination and, and wide he had six forks on a 12 or more frame big old massive bases with long pyramid eye guards i got a real good look at him i wasn't 30 yards from that deer but it happened so quick i just gawked instead of being pro and you know i was my second year down there i think when i saw him and i wasn't good enough hunter to think to throw up try to get off a shot and once he spooked, he was going to go. He stopped twice to go under big overhanging mesquite land. And when no stops occurred, some good hunter could have shot him. I mean, he was in the clear. I could have shot twice and didn't. I'm just gawking at him. I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I just didn't see that happening like it did. Too inexperienced to be ready for it. I never saw another deer even close to him as far as being a trophy. His mass was so big. He outweighed all the other deer that I've let get away that were big. Now, I've, I've let some big ones in the Kennedy get away. Widespreads, tall racks, the typical Ben and Crockett. But I'd rather had the deer at Ensign now than any of the Kennedy bucks. One of them 190 steel dressed deer, you know, big, huge body deer look like a Bramer bow. I just put the <laughs> The one that got away, that, those the ones that eat at you. Yep, yep. Maybe I should, uh, you know, draw a picture of that rack. I'm the only one that could outline that rack properly and then have some guy that was real good with pencil and fine tune it. But he was enormous. Oh, yeah. Easily a two. That'd be badass. 
228. He was huge. That's insane. Good lord. They, they killed some so big. What's the biggest buck you ended up killing out there? Oh, in that in that uh, red Nunley, I never killed a big one. We got run out of there. They caught two kids. Uh, one of the kids that was with me on the one tough six point, he got caught in there with another kid that worked there at the taxidermy. And boy, that place got hot. And I mean, they were in there tracking after that. They said they found a deer that I shot and thought I missed, a big eight point velvet horn, about a 168 point. They found him out in this root plow. I didn't know he moved. He moved from where I shot him. When I went out there to get him a little later after he kind of calmed down and some time went by, I could not find that big velvet horn buck in October. And they told these kids that they had found that deer. That's what got it hot. They found that big velvet horn laying out there. But they tracked them down and threw down on them with automatic looking weapons, you know. That one guy, the security, he said, Red Nunley told us to just break your guns in half over a tree. And that one kid said, you do, and you'll be sorry you did it. <laughs> he probably meant it. <laughs> <laughs> They had to think it over. Back then, it was a $200 fine. $205 each got them out of trouble. You know? Jeez. I mean, that's how cheap the fines that's were. Cheap. That's why everybody was poaching. It's like they speeding, was like speeding ticket. There wasn't no big deal if they caught you. The glory 70, days. Yeah, about 78. Yeah, or that may have been 79, too. That's what that was. Um, I, I'm not sure. You know, it's been a long time. I haven't been telling many stories. I've been listening to a lot of them. And it's helped me remember some stuff that's coming in part two. And, I mean, a couple of real revelations occurred to me listening to some of my Hunter's Advantage podcast. I know some of the players involved. I remember more of the story. And so there's a lot more coming in part two, even about some of the previously podcast, you know, broadcast. Because, you know, on a hot mic, I'll slip and leave out stuff. And then when I hear it again, I go, man, I left out one of the best parts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll have it in part two. It happens. You know? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Charlie, yeah. it happens, man. You're one of the best storytellers in all of the outdoor industry. And obviously, you have a, a pile of stories to tell. And we could just listen to you for hours and hours. Everybody go check out like all your previous podcasts with Hunter's Advantage. I know you've done a couple. The big Honker. The Big Honker is where I first listened big to Big Honkers. You. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the first two with Big Honker are as good as they get. I mean, on Spotify, yep. 168 yeah. and 257, the material we cover and the introduction factor to what actually took place and an overall view of it, there's a lot of good stuff in those. They're solid go. As a matter of fact, when those two episodes came out, they put me and them, I think, on the map for good. They were the two most yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. downloaded Google search engine stats hunting podcast. They went to number one immediately, <laughs> and they've never left first place. And, and so they're hot. 100%. It's a shame they weren't video where I could have dramatized some of it better. But it's pretty intense. You know, both of those are my favorites. The only the only thing I'll say that I don't like about your previous podcast is whenever those guys start their intros with you, they always have to start it as, "Oh, we, you know, this was back in the day when it wasn't as we bad." We don't condone this. this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, let the man tell his fucking stories. You know, this yeah. is why everybody come here to listen to him. They don't want to hear your soft side of this intro. <laughs> like, they want to hear the stories. This is what we're all here for. Save the bullshit. Yeah. yeah, it is what it is, it was what it was, and it ain't what it ain't. I couldn't water it down and, and make an impact with it. And the purpose of that impact yep. is so I get everybody's attention. And when I give my testimony for God in part two, everybody's going to know I'm telling the truth. There's not going to be any doubt in their minds about me, my you know mentality to remember what happened, and, and all the details are going to be convincing. I've got an unbelievable testimony coming, and this is just building the platform or the foundation for it. And when it's out, no one will be able to deny it and put it down and say it didn't happen. I'm going to be telling the truth. You know. So Anybody that listens to your podcast will know you're not a liar because none of your stories change. 
They're all yeah. the exact same. And a yeah, liar never old, tells a story the same way. Yeah, my old boss down there one time, a guy asked him, he said, Charlie Bowie says he saw a Boone and Crockett deer that got away. He said, you believe he saw a Boone and Crockett? He said, Charlie Bowie is a lot of things. He said, but one thing he's not, that's a liar. He said, if he's told you he saw a <laughs> Boone and Crockett, he saw one, he knows what they look like. <laughs> Oh, boss down there. Charlie has seen a couple Boone and Crockett bucks in his day. Just a few. Yeah. Just a few. <laughs> the problem is they got away. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, that they do. I just want to yeah. say, Charlie, when you make it on Rogan one day, I know you will. I know you've been pushing for that. Just don't forget us, man. We appreciate your All time. Right. We appreciate you coming in. We'll definitely have to get back together. Yeah, I appreciate y'all having me on, too. I know little Susie Whitaker, Mullinex, she's going to like me having her hat on here, a little hunt swap, a little, head, a little shout out for her. She threw that in and said, Where oh, are yeah. what's, what's hunt swap all about? Tell us about hunt swap real quick. You know, I'm not real detailed on it, but it puts hunters in touch with other hunters where if they can help one another hunt another animal, a different game animal in a different area of the nation, that they connect them. Yeah. They're just, you know, like a hunter's guide to other hunters where they connect and, and everybody gets a chance to mingle and, and share their knowledge and, and, and places to go and the quality of the animals that are there. And I think it's a real good organization, you know. I don't know that they've been around that long, but they're doing a good work, and it's bound to grow and help a lot of hunters find other information about other places. It's, it's a solid deal. Are you on there anymore offering any more King or Kitty Ranch hunts? Because I'm willing to swap with you. <laughs> well, you know, if I wasn't getting older and getting through that battle with cancer and still strong, I wouldn't be against them letting me guide some sort of celebrity hunt for big money. I can oh, make man. something out of it, get to see the ranch again, and you know, show them who the king is. But uh, you know, that'll probably never happen. Right. You know, when I That's met Ted, when I met Ted Nugent, he wanted me to go down there with him and rattle for him. And I said, Ted, they won't let me on that ranch. And he said, Well, why wouldn't they? And I said, Call and ask them if you don't believe me. But I said, They're not going to let you bring me <laughs> down there and rattle for you. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta we gotta bridge that gap we need the the charlie Beatty documentary where we're walking back through the king and kennedy and, and and you're walking through the stories right and we're videotaping it that's what the world needs yeah you know it would be hard to reproduce it but i feel like i really am convinced that one day there'll be a movie i may be dead and gone but I don't know how accurate they could depict some of those really good rattles and those big deer charging in fully aggressive. They'd have to film some of it in, in you know, in reality, in real live action, and just let people think that yeah. was the deer I was talking about because it's impossible to duplicate the racks and the stories the way they went down. There's so many differences in them, you know, and, and you couldn't mimic that. But Hollywood can do a lot of stuff, you know, Hollywood can surprise you. They might, you know, develop a bunch of robots that can act it out and look more like a real deer than a real deer. You never know. But that's what people would well, want to see. Well, if they ever do make a documentary, you just yeah, go ahead play. and let them know that I'll play you. <laughs> they wouldn't want to see my ugly face on there. I'll play you in your younger years. <laughs> Michael Ornelas in his acting debut as Charlie Beatty. <laughs> yeah, my son wants to, if it ever comes to a movie, my son Nathan wants to be the one who plays me. And I've got a nephew. Well, I don't blame him. Yeah, and on that Ramus hunt, my nephew, since my brother's gone now, my nephew could play Ramus. So it would be both our sons hey, playing us perfect. on that Ramus hunt. Oh, that'd be a good one. That'd be perfect. Of course, I'd have to co-direct to give them all the right things hey, to well. say. <laughs> <laughs> Make that happen. One of, one of us could be George. One of us could be Larry. There's plenty of parts we could fill in. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know if they could duplicate George or not. He was one of a kind. That man loved hunting deer more than anybody. And he had bigger balls than I did when I was operated on and they swole up. I mean, George would go <laughs> think about going. He was going to Robert East and hunt right up against their ranch house. He killed a bunny crockett right against their ranch house. And when the troops came after him immediately, he had to leave the blood trail and go. He had a 22 Magnum. He shot him right in the throat. Blood just went everywhere. And he went over the sand dune towards the ranch house. He said trucks fired up all over the place and came after him. He said he didn't have any choice but to bail and wait and try to go back for him later. He said he got scared thinking they probably found the blood trail and went right to him and found him. He said, I never went back that close to the ranch house again. But, I mean, he wasn't 300 yards from Robert Ames' main ranch house in Jim Hall County. I wouldn't have went there if you paid me, you know. But George had came to all now. I'm telling you, he did shit that nobody would do. You got another story from part two you want to share with us that won't take too much of your time before you got to get your pups in? Man, I would have to think a moment. Uh, all right, I'll tell you what. I took another guy that his name was actually the same as mine. His name was Beatty, but he was no kin to me. His first name was Layton. I don't know if he's still living or not. But Layton was a pretty soft guy. He was diabetic. He had to take his insulin on the trip and keep his shots up where he wouldn't get blood sugar lost, you know low blood sugar and he manned up and went we went on a nine-day hunt that prior to larry going with me i'm just taking Leighton on this nine-day hunt and we did the same thing we went in on the highway and we circled all the way i think we walked 90 to 100 miles he stayed tough he stayed with me the whole way but one of he's one of the guys that i put a buck right on him and it just exploded and turned inside out right in his face and we just scared the shit out of him but one night we're in our sleeping bag sleeping and a darn rat got up on top of his sleeping bag and one of them out owl came down through there and just snatched that rat right off the top of his sleeping bag and that flipped him out pretty bad. But then another night we're sleeping and his he was sleeping so sound that several rats, pack rats, got in his sleeping bag with him. And all of a sudden, he woke me up, and he's sitting up, and he's just slapping his sleeping bag like crazy. And I go, what the hell's wrong with you, Layton? And he goes, rats, rats. He just stood up naked, <laughs> took his bag out, rats went flying everywhere. There must have been eight or nine of them pack rats in his sleeping bag. <laughs> and he killed three beautiful deer. He killed a 20-point buck. And that 20-point came blowing in there, just -ra 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 -ra, and just froze five yards from us. <clears throat> I put my face down, and I was looking at him with one eye, and I was sitting there thinking, shoot, shoot, shoot. He had the gun pointed right at his head and neck because all of it was sticking out. My angle was a little different. He couldn't see the shoot. But finally, after about three long minutes, that buck turned his head, and when he turned his head, pow, shot him right under the ear. <laughs> he was just waiting for him to turn out from behind that one tree at five yards. He just hit the deck straight down. I mean, what a, that's the closest you can wrap one up. And he had 20 beautiful points. He's, he had massive beams. He's a beautiful deer. He's going to be in part two. I've got great pictures of him. Killed a big old high yeah. nine point bird. He shot three beautiful deer. One of them wasn't real good, but those two were excellent deer. Yeah. <laughs> at the time of his life, he nearly died at the Buckhorn Saloon. You know, once he got his shot, after we got there, he stayed in the bathroom, and I made the phone call, and I went in and got us a snack and a drink, and he stayed in the bathroom on the side of the building, and I was getting worried about him because he was really lagging. And I said, you're going to be all right? And he said, I'll be okay after I take my shot and get a little something in my stomach. And so he took an insulin shot in the bathroom there. And I gave him some food and drink, and he, he leveled off. By the time our ride got there, he was on cloud nine, you know, coming home. When you leave out of there, there's something you leave behind. And that's all the pain, all the miles, all the suffering, you know, all the work. That stays in the ranch. 
when you come out, all you can think about is those big heads you've got to mount. You know? <laughs> you get long after that's gone, you know. It's just nothing but the pride in the trophies then. You know, that love for hunting just erases all that pain and effort you had to go through. But Lake didn't get to Absolutely. see the helicopters. He didn't have any helicopter adventure. I was kind of glad because I don't think he could have stood it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he was kind of nervous. Might have been a tough on old Layton. Yeah, it might have KO'd him, you know. <laughs> He'll be in part two. Yeah, he had the time Dude. of his life. Everybody that went with me had the time of their life. That I mean, sure sounds like it. Yeah, on the first round with the second cop, each, you know, two bucks come running in and a 158 or 159, 10 point long eye guards, 22 to three inches inside, came right up and he hit a grapevine. Arrow went straight up in the air. And he kept his composure and stayed quiet, knocked another arrow, and the buck ran past me and went out into the open. I bleeded and stopped him. He stopped and looked back. He shot about a 35 to 40 yard shot from inside the oaks to him and it lobbed in beautiful height, but the deer's butt was facing us and he shot him right in the ass, right in one hand. Nothing but the <laughs> And I thought that's a good hit if he got the femoral artery. We'll find him. There'll be blood everywhere we'll find him. That'll, but it was high, it. Yeah. thick coastal grass for miles out there in that prairie. We looked a while. We couldn't pick up a blood trail out in that grass. I don't know if he hit the artery or missed it. Probably missed the artery. And that's why we couldn't find blood sprayed all over that grass. But as soon as he made the shot and the buck disappeared in the fog, he goes, Unbelievable! I'm fucking believable, man! He had never seen nothing like that. I mean, I broke his cherry wide open on the first round. <laughs> <laughs> we did go on, you know, two real trophy bucks later, about the same deal. We had to look to find one the next morning, and he was out there looking for it, and I found it first, and I held it up, and man, same thing. He goes, unbelievable, I fucking believe one ran to me. I was holding it up over the grass, you know, 174. Oh, Jesus. He missed it, too, on the, on the grapevine, and I found that era later that year. But the second shot, he shot him right in the throat, just under the throat latch. Blood went everywhere. Air burst into splinters. It was, you know, one of the most awesome shots I've ever witnessed. But that's all coming in part two. That was quite a recovery. I showed him my skills when we tracked that one down and found it. <laughs> he got to arguing with Golly. me, and I had to show him who was boss. <laughs> <laughs> we're excited about part two when uh do you know when that's going to come out charlie man i'm still probably two months away from getting it to the press but i'm beating my head against the wall on it i just come out of being buried again with the shipping of christmas and it's slowing down now so i think i'm going to be able to get to the grindstone you know if i had a wife or if i had a secretary that drive all the way out here in the country every about two days a week take care of the shipping for me I could sit down and do nothing but writing, and it'd be out pretty soon. But I haven't had any help at all. You know, I lost four months last year at this same time renovating this room into an office. And that, you know, all by myself. Four and a half months to tear the room out from under the tent and rebuild the walls, the floor. I had two men come tile the floor, but I'm not getting any help, you know. And I've still had some problems with my health, but I'm feeling stronger every day. It's just a matter of time. I'm not going to let everybody down. You know, God's going to make it happen right on time, in his timing, and it'll be there. when it Once it's here, it's like Jim Carrey used to say, it's going to be party time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're going to do any more renovating, you got three of us right here. If you've got any of them old pins. Or any old fucking maps you got drawn yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you just drop us at the gate. <laughs> if we came last year, we'd have part two out now. It's going to happen. Shoot. I am it. Right. We're looking forward to it, Charlie. And again, I, we know you got to let your dogs in. 
We appreciate you joining us this evening. It was a blast. Uh, as Definitely. always, best stories of all time. Definitely want them back. Well, there's a ton yeah. more coming. I mean, like I said, part two is it's probably three times the material as part one. So there's a ton of more stories coming. The way I remember them all is to do them in order. In, in chronological order with the photo albums I've got, I'm able to piece it all together in order and leave nothing out, you know, as long as I'm taking my time doing it. It won't be a missing yeah, link. We appreciate it. Before before part two comes out, we'll have you back on, man. We'll do a little celebration. I mean, obviously, we'll let everybody we know know part two's coming out, and we we wish nothing but the best success for you. Um, you know, you deserve it. You got the best hunting stories in the in the industry, man. And again, thank you for coming on, and we'll do it again. Well, I'm. We'll I'm come, we'll come out to Texas one day. We'll come out. We'll come out to Texas and film some of them deer heads yeah. you got on the wall. Yeah, we could cut one right here in the office. Then it'd be a lot better. That's, way, that's the only way to do it, brother. That's the only way. Yeah. We're coming to Texas. Yeah, yeah but I, I promise. I promise. Jeff Stanfield and Andy Shaver first shot at part two. They brought oh. you. Know, you got to dance with the one that brung you. And uh, hey, I told I don't them blame that. You. I don't blame you. And I've, I've come up with the idea to do a live, maybe a hundred men audience when we cut that podcast at the Big Honker Lodge. And I told him, I said, what do you think about that? And he said, I think that's genius. We're going to pick, I said, you pick the men that are going to be there and we'll cut the whole thing left. Your names will be on the list. I'll get a few invitations Put out. Put us on the guest list, Charlie. Yeah, that's Put us it. on the yeah. guest list. And so it's yeah, gonna we'll be rock. honorary. Everybody else will be big hunkers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get to do the intro. <laughs> All right. Hell yeah. Well, we'll, well see thank you, Charlie. Way, and tell your buddy thank you again for getting you set up. Thanks for having me.